Hello, and welcome to today's virtual book reading of Not Part of the Job, How to Take a Stand Against Violence in the Work Setting. I'm Joe Valina, your host and director of publishing here at the American Nurses Association. With me today are authors Jane Lipscomb and Matt London. On behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Throughout the virtual reading, you can use the controls on the Google Hangouts to submit questions for the authors or for me. At the end of the presentation, we will address those questions. Don't forget that attendees of today's Google Hangout can get 15% off the purchase of the book by logging on to nursesbooks.org and entering the promo code VBR2015. That's VBR2015, as in Virtual Book Reading 2015. Jane and Bat will be reading selected passages from the book today and will answer specific questions or read requested portions at the end of the program. So let's get started. I'll now turn it over to Jane and Matt, who will briefly introduce themselves. Jane, can you please begin? Sure, thanks, Joe. Um, we're very excited to have this opportunity to share with you our experiences that led to the writing and publication of this book. The ANA has asked each of us to share a bit of our background so that you can better understand our perspective and the experience we have with this topic. So therefore, by way of introduction, I bet that you can already guess that I am the Jane Lipscomb of the Matt and Jane Show. Um, my background, I'm a, I'm a RN and I'm a professor at the University of Maryland School of Nursing and Medicine. Um, I also spend part of my time directing the Center for Community-Based Engagement and Learning here at the University of Maryland. I've conducted research into the prevention of occupational injuries and illnesses in healthcare and social service workplaces for over 20 years, and much of that time my focus has been on workplace violence. Between 1999 and 2012, I and my colleagues were awarded four large uh, multi-year government grants um, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, and NIOSH. Uh, these grants were used to evaluate the impact of a range of risk factors and interventions designed to reduce violence in healthcare and social services. I'll note this now, and then I think it'll become apparent when we talk about our work. Um, all of this research that we have done has been done in close partnership with the workers and their employer in each of the settings. Um, the work has taken us to four states, um, distributed throughout the country, and a wide range of um, types of healthcare settings. We've done a significant amount of work in the inpatient psychiatric setting also um, residential addiction treatment center and then um, another interest of ours has been um, community-based organizations and those who work alone in the community doing home visits for example. So much of this work that um, I just mentioned formed the basis of this book um, but in addition to my experience with the topic as an academic researcher I also worked as a clinical nurse many years ago now, but more importantly, I teach graduate nursing students who share with me many stories of their current work lives and working conditions that serve to validate the information that we will share during this hour. Um, and then just finally, prior to joining the faculty here at the University of Maryland, I spent three years um, as a senior scientist and I was a liaison to OSHA in the Office of the Director of NIOSH and before that I was at the University of California San Francisco School of Nursing. Here's Matt. Thanks. Like Jane, I have a fairly long and varied background in occupational health and safety. In fact, Jane and I worked together for a couple of years at NIOSH conducting worksite investigations of a variety of hazards. Following that, I moved to New York State where I worked at the health department, developing a statewide network of occupational medicine clinics where workers could go to get an independent expert diagnosis for their work-related illness. My interest in workplace violence prevention really began, though, when my cousin, a retail worker, a young woman, was murdered at work in the early 1990s. 
has obviously had a profound impact on uh, the entire family. I then began hearing uh, other workers' tragic stories and really had my eyes opened again in 1998 when a fellow member of my union, Judy Scanlon, was also murdered at work. Judy was an intensive case manager who was murdered while conducting a home visit. When a couple of years later, I got the opportunity to join Jane's workplace violence prevention research team, I jumped at the chance. Okay, back to you, Joe. <laughs> So because we had some folks uh, join us a little bit late, I will mention again that, uh, not to forget, today's attendees can get 15% off the purchase price of the book by going to nursesbooks.org and entering the code VBR2015, as in virtual book reading 2015. Um, with that, let's go ahead and move on to the actual virtual reading. So Jane or Matt, please uh, take it away. Okay. Um, I've chosen to begin by reading uh, two brief excerpts to address sort of the why we wrote this book and we'll also mention the who, what, and how of the book. Violence towards staff is widespread in healthcare and social assistance workplaces. This is despite decades of attention to the problem by individuals and organizations within the field of mental health, public health, and of course nursing. The problem of workplace violence in healthcare and social assisted workplaces continues in part because of a strong reluctance to fully acknowledge and address the problem. A primary factor in this reluctance is often the fear of stigmatizing the potential perpetrators of the violence, particularly the mentally ill, developmentally disabled, and cognitively impaired elderly. Well, we found that is in addition, healthcare workers and employers often use the question of the perpetrator's intent as a reason for not labeling the behavior as violent and therefore not searching for and adopting preventive measures. Unfortunately, there also remains a prevalent attitude that violence towards those working with the public, especially individuals, individuals with cognitive impairment, mental illness or brain injury is just part of the job. So in this book we discuss these factors and others that um, in our experience create barriers to efforts to reduce violence towards healthcare workers across a whole range of settings. We also very importantly offer strategies and tools which we have found effective in addressing and reducing these barriers. While we offer steps that individual workers can take to make themselves safer at work, much of our focus is on the, critically, the critical importance of collective action and building partnerships among workers, patient advocates, administrators, security personnel, and others in order to affect change at the organizational level. So now a little bit of who this book is for. The book is intended for nurses, but we're hoping it's also useful for other um, health care and social assistant workers, administrators, professional organizations, unions, and anyone else who has a stake in preventing workplace violence. This work um, the went, that went into this book and the book itself is really intended as a how-to manual or a primer. This is not a textbook. Um, or a summary of research and when ANA invited us to write this book they made it very clear that you know they didn't want um, a book that would be read by researchers that it was really for frontline nurses and we just were very excited about this opportunity so we sincerely hope that you'll find the information um, in this reading helps you to reduce workplace violence in your work setting Matt. Okay. So as I began working with Jane and with uh, the New York State Public Employees Federation, uh, I learned more about Judy Scanlon, who I just mentioned, and about other assault victims, including Jill, an RN who was working at a New York State psychiatric hospital, whose story we briefly summarized on page five of the book. Uh, I'll read a couple excerpts from that. In November 1996, Jill was attacked by a new patient, a six-foot, 250-pound man with a history of arson who had already murdered someone. 
On that day, the new patient attempted to strangle Jill by pinning her against a wall. But as she struggled, he changed tactics and began punching her in the face, causing her head to bang against the wall with each blow. She fell to the ground after being pummeled, and he began to kick her repeatedly. No doubt in my mind I'd be dead, said Jill, but fortunately, another patient had overheard the attack and intervened to save her life. As Jill was still lying on the ground and the attacker was being taken away, Jill's boss said, quote, he'll be back. Jill described, later described the day she left the hospital including her trip to the police station where she was hunched over in pain still and in fact had to support her jaw just so that she could speak to the authorities. Jill said the police officer at the front desk wouldn't even take her statement, telling Jill, quote, you knew the risks before taking the job. The officer took his, finally did take a statement, but only after Jill's husband was insistent. Jill's story is unfortunately all too common. I suspect many of you on the call have equally harrowing stories you could tell. So how common is this? Let's talk a little, I won't uh, overwhelm you with too many statistics, but let's talk a little about how uh, prevalent this problem is. So at the time of uh, Jill and Judy's assaults in the 1990s, there were more than a thousand workplace homicides annually in the U.S. There are less now roughly uh, half that number, five, six hundred. There's no single source of reliable data for the number of non-fatal assaults, but here are some estimates. The National Crime Victimization Survey periodically publishes reports. In the early 2000s, they estimated that there were 1.7 million work-related assaults annually. Ten years later, they estimated that there were 570,000. Their survey methods appear to have changed. Um, we've been, frankly, unable to get a clear understanding of exactly what changed, but nobody is suggesting that there are now only one-third as many assaults each year as there were a decade ago. And frankly, this discrepancy underscores the difficulty in getting accurate data. According to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, the healthcare sector represents roughly 60% of the total of workplace assaults. Workers' compensation, which has state-by-state -state systems that, that differ from each other, is another source of data, as is each facility's OSHA injury and illness log. However, we know each data set has its own limitations, and overall, uh, we know that workplace injuries and illnesses generally and workplace assaults specifically are often significantly underreported. So let's just talk for a second about why this would be. There really are a variety of reasons that I'll mention, and I suspect many of you, you know, on this call will be able to, you know, from your own experience, come up with others. Um, you know, we know that some employers actively discourage reporting, either by having a policy that makes it difficult to report, or by retaliating overtly or sometimes subtly against workers who report uh, incidents, labeling those workers as troublemakers. Given the lack of action in many workplaces around workplace violence, workers may feel, quote, why bother? Nothing will happen. In other situations, uh, Workers might believe that it was their own fault that the assault occurred or that at least it wasn't really the patient's fault. The patient didn't really know what they were doing. Finally, there's uh, the attitude by some employers and sometimes the workers that, quote, this is part of the job. Uh, hence the title of our book. Jane? Thanks, Matt. So having... Um talked about why we wrote the book and what we know about um, the magnitude of the problem, I now am going to turn our attention and read a few passages that address what we know about risk factors that contribute to the problem of workplace violence, specifically in healthcare, but many of them apply to um, workplaces in general. So there are several categories of risk factors that we use to think through this 
question of what are the risk factors that then demand some sort of control strategy. So um, there are patient specific risk factors, um, visitor specific risk factors, staff, and work environment. All of those factors contribute to the problem. So even though I'm going to read some excerpts that talk about um, factors within each of these categories, it's really important to recognize that it's rarely a single factor, but rather an interaction of these factors that contribute to staff, and I would add patient injury. And as such, prevention strategies need to address these factors as they exist in combination within what is a very dynamic healthcare work environment. So I want to start by um, highlighting some of the risk factors that both NIOSH and, and OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health um, Administration, have uh, published in documents about the problem of workplace violence. Um, NIOSH states working with unstable or volatile persons in healthcare, social service or criminal justice, working in community-based settings. Um, OSHA adds to that by including hospitals that are um, used as holds for um, acutely disturbed violent individuals. Um, there is also the factor, and this continues to happen, that there's an increased number of mentally ill patients who have been deinstitutionalized over the decades or released from psychiatric hospitals with inadequate follow-up these workers often end up um, being cared for in general hospitals where perhaps staff haven't been trained in the work environment does not um, provide appropriate prevention. Certainly isolated work with clients um, is a huge risk factor and one we focus a lot on in our work. Um, certainly when there is a lack of appropriate training, um, that can increase the risk. I'll say right here, though, even though workplace violence prevention training is a very necessary part of an overall program, it by no way is sufficient as a program in and of itself. And um, I think this will resonate with many of you. Many hospitals and other healthcare organizations think that if they have training, regardless of the quality of it, they're, you know, have controls or they have a strategy to address workplace violence. And again, it's, it's an important part of an overall program. Um, so these observations that have been made by both OSHA and NIOSH in these documents really are corroborated by the work that we've done. So I want to talk now a little bit about what we know about patient characteristics. Um, most of what we do know comes from large population-based studies that have primarily focused on subgroups with the diagnosis of mental illness and substance abuse disorder. And when these data are reviewed, it suggests that individuals with um, the following characteristics in aggregate pose an increased risk of violence. So, Having a history of violent behavior is one of the most important risk factors, and this has huge implications for what you need to do as an organization. I mean, you, you really need to focus on getting as in-depth a history as possible when you're getting an admission. <coughs> Excuse me. Certain psych psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, spectrum disorders, major affective disorders, substance abuse, dementia, and other conditions which limit cognition and impulse control. Um, related to individual characteristics, it's also important to recognize that patients who suffer from mental illness and substance abuse, or one or the other, who are seen in the emergency department, which we all recognize as a high-risk area, those individuals often have multiple risk factors in addition to these that I've been talking about which increase their risk for perpetrating violence. For instance, many of them come with a history of trauma, unemployment, homelessness, and experience with the criminal justice justice system. So in addition to their, you know, their, their mental illness or their use of drugs, they've got this overlay of these other risk factors. <clears throat> 
So um, research that has examined the relationship among mental illness, substance abuse, and violence, again, confirms that most individuals with mental health diagnosis are not violent. So we're not, again, saying that um, the majority of individuals with mental illness are violent. That's definitely not the case. Um, and in fact, those with anxiety disorders do not seem to be at increased risk. Um, but certainly what we've seen in the, the, the news as of late um, with these horrible shootings at multiple, um, in multiple communities at schools and other where suggests that, you know, you do see someone with an underlying mental illness and um, other risk factors. So I think that news puts our work really into contact. So one other thing I want to mention about um, patient-specific risk factors is um, there's been a number of studies published that note that in the mental health inpatient setting, there is often a small number of patients who are responsible for a substantial proportion of the patient on patient or the patient on staff assaults. In our work, which we did in state-run inpatient psychiatric hospitals, we found that on average 40 to 70 percent of the patient on staff assaults were due to just three or four patients. And the per, uh, percentage of patient on patient assaults committed by just a few patients was also similar. So these are not always the same patients, but it's really important to identify those individual patients who are contributing to um, a significant amount of, of violence and um, focus on interventions related to that group. So then finally, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Matt, I just, we can't talk about um, preventing workplace violence or any other health and safety hazard without addressing the question and issue of staffing. Um, as we say in the book, ensuring that there is adequate staffing is it's a critical work organization characteristic that must be part of any genuine strategy to prevent violence. Um, a number of professional nursing organizations led by the ANA have been actively involved in the national discourse, including research and health policy, emphasizing the influence of staffing on the safety of both patients and workers. Um, there is also a broad recognition that rising patient acuity in short and hospital stays contribute to adverse patient and staff outcomes. So, so staffing is very, very important. Um, we've conducted numerous um, focus groups and in addition to these risk factors, um, some things that workers have brought to our attention is they talk about fatigue from working overtime, especially when that overtime is mandatory. It, they've described the impact of overtime on, a, on their ability to react with empathy and patience when clients are disruptive or their behavior is escalating. They've also made the point that inadequate staffing contributes to violence because often staff members are not available emotionally to the clients. And we've, Matt and I, in some focus groups we did with um, with patients in New York State, we heard that. They acknowledged that one of the things that often sets them off is not having sufficient numbers of staff available to them. So Matt. Thanks. In chapter 15 of the book, we address some additional underlying or systemic causes of workplace violence in healthcare. Um, let me talk about some of those here. So. You know, certainly the financial environment facing most of our institutions is a major, major factor in this. Um, it obviously leads to some of the short staffing issues that Jane just described, uh, leads to excessive overtime. You know, in frankly, in some institutions in New York State, there were staff that were working, believe it or not, 1,200 to 1,400 hours of overtime a year, which means they were working on average about 60 to 70 hour weeks for all 52 years. Um, and obviously, you know, that's a risk factor in and of itself. Um, 
you know, other impact of the financial uh, constraints, there's little money available for making safety improvements to the facility. We certainly saw that when we uh, were working with a number of different agencies where, you know, they would have a wish list of some, you know, very critical changes to the physical environment. And, you know, those, frankly, were sent forward with their annual budget year after year, and they never could get the funds released for it. Um, you know, another impact, you know, short staffing, the flip side of that, obviously, is that caseloads have increased significantly. And as Jane said, you know, the there have been changes uh, in terms of the patients or clients that you guys serve, uh, both in terms of you know, more severe acuity of their health problems, but also an increasing percentage. And we heard this, frankly, in, you know, with every group of workers that we worked with, whether they were working in a, uh, you know, medical hospital or a psychiatric hospital or a uh, correctional setting or addiction treatment areas, you know, we heard that virtually every one of their patients had multiple issues. They had medical issues, they had mental health issues, they had addiction issues, they had history of violence. You know, they may not have had all of those, but it was the rare patient that only presented with one issue. Um, you know, other, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about, uh, you know, some other issues that are related to patient rights. And this sometimes can be the elephant in the room. But, you know, we certainly all believe strongly that patients have important rights and that they should be cared for with dignity. But we also know that in some instances, patient safety is viewed as uh, being in opposition to staff safety. And we've seen too many situations where, uh, you know, managers of hospitals and other uh, settings prioritize patient safety over staff safety. Um, you know, we believe it's a fundamentally false dichotomy. I mean, if, if workers are getting injured, it absolutely has to have a, a direct impact on the quality of care that they can provide, both because there's less staff on the floor to provide care, but also, you know, it just impacts any individual's ability to be compassionate and provide the kind of care that they want to provide. Um, you know, in practice, this kind of, uh, you know, dichotomy or, uh, you know, juxtaposing patient rights to staff rights means that many institutions have uh, implemented policies that absolutely b ban uh, restraint, seclusion, or any laying on of hands to patients, even if the patient may be escalating um, or already uh, becoming assaultive. So, you know, sensible policies need to be implemented, and they need to be implemented with input from staff, and it needs to be understood what the impact on sort of overall safety and patient care is. Given how serious and pervasive workplace violence is, you know, and we talked earlier about, you know, how prevalent the problem is, and I'm sure everybody, you know, on this, uh, you know, call has stories that, that they can tell. What's the role of regulation in addressing this problem? Uh, within the book, we talked about this in some detail in Chapter 5. We just want to go over a little of it here. Most of you, I suspect, have heard of OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, it's a federal agency. It's in the Federal Department of Labor. And it is the most powerful regulatory authority protecting workers from occupational hazards. But there's some things you should know. First, OSHA only covers private sector workplaces. So if you're working, uh, you know, for a county or a state government or even federal government, um, you're not inherently covered by OSHA. Whether or not public sector workplaces are covered is decided on a state-by-state -state basis. And as a result, public sector workers only have OSHA protection in half the states. Second, OSHA, well actually second is the level of staffing OSHA has. OSHA basically has been flatlined for many years and so there's truly a shortage of 
uh, inspectors and real constraints on what OSHA is able to do. But the next thing that I want to say is that OSHA regulates relatively few hazards directly. And in fact, there's not an OSHA standard that covers workplace violence. I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that. It should be noted that there are some states, you know, roughly a dozen, I think, uh, that have enacted state-based um, regulations. New York State has a particularly comprehensive one that only covers public sector workers in New York State. Um, you know, and these state-based regulations are of varying quality and comprehensiveness. Um, getting back to OSHA, so all hazards like workplace violence, that don't have their own standard are covered in theory by OSHA's general duty clause. This was part of the initial OSHA Act and it requires all employers to quote, provide a safe and healthful workplace. Sounds pretty straightforward, but this turns out to be a pretty high bar. To obtain a general duty clause citation, the following conditions need to be met. One or more workers in that workplace need to have been killed or seriously injured due to that hazard. The employer needs to have been aware that the hazard existed, and there needs to be some generally accepted prevention measures that are available to mitigate that hazard. So because OSHA has been barred from enacting a workplace violence standard, and that is why OSHA does not have one, top OSHA officials would love to have a workplace violence standard. But because OSHA has been barred from enacting one, they've begun doing more general duty clause inspections for workplace violence in the past couple of years. But, you know, as I said a second ago, it's not that easy to, uh, to issue citations to an employer for violations of the general duty clause. It's also important to know that OSHA has published some very good guidance on workplace violence prevention over the past 20 years. And earlier this year, they updated and published a revised edition of guidelines for preventing workplace violence for healthcare and social service workers. And, you know, I think both Jane and I feel that that document, uh, in tandem with our book, frankly, provides a real wealth of practical ideas and information for any of you wanting to do workplace violence prevention work in your facility. Jane? Thanks, Matt. Um, I'll just elaborate on what Matt had to say about the general duty clause. Let me just ask, are you hearing an echo? A little bit, it just started. Okay. Um, so, yes, um, OSHA doesn't have as much muscle as we wish they did when it comes to regulating workplace violence, um, but in the last couple of years, federal OSHA has inspected more than a dozen healthcare or social service um, organizations, and they've issued a number of citations. A number of those citations have been contested by the employer, but none of them have actually successfully been contested by way of, you know, going to the, um, through the court system. And um, I know this because I've actually um, served as an expert witness in a number of these cases. So um, it's really great to see that OSHA um, is using its muscle where it can to hold uh, employers accountable. OSHA actually is also um, creating some additional very useful educational tools that are going to soon be available on um, the OSHA website, which focuses on some best practices around this issue. So leaving, though, the discussion about um, using your rights as a worker to um, demand a safe workplace via exercising your rights to call OSHA in, there is another tool which comes our way via voluntary certifying body standards. Um, I think most of you will recognize this through the name the Joint Commission. So um, it's well recognized that the Joint Commission, although not a regulatory um, agency, is a major driver in care delivery in the United States. 
Uh, it's a non-for-profit organization that accredits and certifies more than 20,000 U.S. healthcare organizations and programs. A healthcare organization's eligibility to receive Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement depends on accreditation, so that's why they pay so much attention to this, and by extension, are quite powerful. Um, although they are widely, as I said, seen as a driver in quality of um, in healthcare. I want to just highlight that the Joint Commission has come under some criticism for their practices of notifying hospitals in advance of timing of the, the inspections. Um, and that has actually resulted in approximately 99% of inspected hospitals being accredited. Um, there's also controversy over the fact that their governing board has been dominated by representatives of the industry it inspects. Um, and then Finally, both the Joint Commission and also the Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities, or CARF, they have historically and continues to this day to, to a great extent had a nearly singular focus on patient safety without regard to worker safety. So it's, it's the point that Matt made about, you know, the pendulum has really swung in terms of doing um, all things to assure quality of care and prevent patients and often disregarding the needs of staff. But um, I want to talk about a couple of tools that the Joint Commission has available which um, I think we should all be using to um, encourage our employers to do more around workplace violence prevention. So. Um, in 2010, they issued, they being the Joint Commission, issued a Sentinel Event Alert 45, uh, preventing violence in the healthcare setting. And this alert requires healthcare facilities to address the problem of violence and develop a written plan describing how the institution provides for the security of patients, yes, visitors, yes, but also staff. So to this end, and again, this is where you should be able to hold your employer accountable. Institutions are required to conduct a risk assessment, which Matt will be talking about in a few minutes, to determine the potential for violence and then provide strategies for preventing incidents of violence and establishing a re response plan that can be activated when an incident occurs. So um, this alert was actually issued because um, between um, the years 2007 to 2009, they saw an increase from um, 26 to 33 incidents reported per year. And interestingly, um, they identify the following potential causal factors. So, um, and again, I'm going to highlight, it's not really focused on the patients or the staff, it's, it's about the environment. So. They said that they identified as causal factors problems in the area of leadership, human resources, assessment, communication, physical environment, and care planning. So um, in our book, we um, have included the alert, and also there are a total of 13 suggested actions, um, which are in an appendice here. So um, one other document that has come out of the Joint Commission, which we think can be helpful, is their framework for conducting a root cause analysis and action plan. And this plan states a root cause is typically a finding related to a process or a system that has a potential for redesign to reduce risk of any sort. Critically important to the process of conducting an analysis is the action plan that is an important part of the assessment. Each finding that they identify as a root cause should then be considered for action and addressed in the action plan. So the goal of a root cause analysis is thus to identify both you know, active errors, errors that occur at the point of the interface between the human and the system, but also what they refer to as latent errors which are those problems within the system itself that contribute to the adverse events, maybe like staffing. So 
we would argue that as such a root cause analysis could be an important tool in preventing violence related staff injuries. So we just urge you to become, become familiar with um, you know both your rights under OSHA but also what accrediting organizations require of your institutions and collectively ensure that your facilities management or the health and safety committee uses these tools to facilitate a comprehensive risk assessment following every single incidence of violence. So Matt now is going to talk about what to do about the problem. Hey Matt, before you go on, I'd like to just mention to our viewers that if you want to um, submit a question or later in the Q&A section, go up to the right hand side of your screen and you'll see a series of small boxes. There are, there's a little icon that looks like nine boxes. Click on that and then they, when you get the uh, pop-up from there, you'll see a little uh, Q&A button. Click that Q&A button and you'll be able to type in your questions for, um, for our authors today. Thanks. Matt, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, we'll take about two more minutes, I think, in going through some of the material Jane and I wanted to lay out, and I hope uh, lots of you, frankly, take Joe up on his offer and submit some good questions. Uh, I'll let Jane take the difficult ones. But uh, so in terms of, you know, as Jane said, I just want to sort of uh, close this part with uh, a brief description of what we're really proposing that that your employer with your involvement actually do to try to prevent workplace violence. And what we're proposing is that frankly every employer uh, take a comprehensive dynamic approach to preventing workplace violence in their setting that's largely consistent with what's laid out in the OSHA guidelines. Uh, the foundation of it is getting top level uh, management commitment and engagement and involving the employees, and if there's a union, their union as well, in all aspects of the process. In the book on page 39, we, discuss, we describe, excuse me, management commitment and employee involvement in the following way. Management commitment must be evident in the form of high-level management involvement and support for the development and implementation of a workplace violence policy and program. Meaningful involvement in policy development, risk assessment activities, a workplace violence committee, post-assault counseling, and critical incident debriefing are all important. It should include frontline workers as well from multiple disciplines, departments, and work shifts. Where a union exists, the union must be allowed to select its representatives. And without both management commitment and employee involvement, Frankly, it's unlikely that an effective program will exist. So why do we as well as OSHA put so much emphasis on this aspect of it? Without management commitment, it's difficult to truly change the workplace. You know, managers are the ones that frankly have a lot of control of the workplace. It's difficult to uh, get policies enacted and enforced and difficult to get the resources necessary for proper staffing or for modifying the physical environment, providing appropriate training, etc. Managers who are part of the process must have decision-making power. It can't just be some low-level manager that frankly has no decision-making power at all. But you know, we, we also argue that worker involvement is equally critical. Workers are the ones with the most direct knowledge of the hazard, of the risk factors that really exist in their workplace, of which prevention measures might be most effective, and with ensuring that the measures implemented don't have unforeseen adverse effects. Working jointly, a comprehensive risk assessment should be conducted by the uh, labor management team, and it should be done at least annually. It, and as I said earlier, it should involve workers from all shifts and from a variety of work areas and job titles. The risk assessment should include a data review looking at all sources of data, including incident reports, workers' compensation logs, etc. How many assaults occurred, how many resulted in lost work time, are the numbers increasing or decreasing, are there specific wards, work shifts, etc. that seem to be at increased risk. Your facility's policies and procedures should be examined as well, 
Is there a clear policy describing a code of conduct or acceptable behaviors for staff, patients, and visitors alike? Are there policies or work practices that help mitigate the risk of workplace violence? Are there any that actually may make the problem worse? Uh, again, we've been talking about staffing. Is staffing adequate? Is the distribution uh, among titles sort of the most efficacious? Is overtime excessive? Are staff working alone or in isolation where they may not be able to get uh, help quickly? You know, we find that this is an enormously important risk factor. Finally, the physical environment should be looked at as well. While we don't want healthcare facilities to look like maximum security prisons, making sure that your facility is designed, laid out, and furnished in a way that does not create risk is important. Are there blind spots in the facility? Should surveillance cameras be considered? Are there furniture that can be easily thrown or used as a weapon? So many, many more details about uh, how to do the risk assessment and uh, prevention measures are provided both in our book and in the OSHA guidance document that I referred to. Again, what's important is that your facility have an ongoing comprehensive process for addressing workplace violence, one that's based on that foundation of management commitment and employee involvement. Jane? Okay, so in closing, um, we hope that you have found the reading of excerpts from this book um, as useful to um, help you become an advocate for and actually demand workplace violence prevention efforts in your workplace. So I just want to um, highlight the fact that at the end of the book, we share examples of such actions that professional nursing associations, including the ANA, have taken to address workplace violence. So there's a rich set of resources in the back of the book. Um, we urge you to connect with the professional group that best represents your practice and get involved. Become a member if you're not already one. Serve on a work group if your professional organization doesn't have an initiative or a work group on work workplace violence, start one. Um, testify before government bodies, write your elected officials, share your experience with the public via editorials in the newspaper, but just get involved. And to help you do that also um, at the end of the book as appendices, we've shared a number of such actions that we, the authors, have taken to draw attention to this issue and inform policymakers regarding what needs to be done to protect nurses and patients from violence on the job. So we just hope that you will consider what you heard today and also the book as a call to action. Thanks so much for your attention. Okay, great. Thank you guys. Um, we do have some questions for the, the Q&A and I would again um, ask that if anyone has further questions, please post them up and uh, we'll see them up here and I'll, I'll ask them to our authors. The first one comes from Brittany Gavin, um, and she asks, I recently did a project for school proposing seclusion for violent or non-self-injurious patients as opposed to a one-to-one -one or two-to-one observation. And this occurred after a string of staff injuries due to increased acuity on her unit. Have you seen any research on this type of approach? Matt, do you want to... I was hoping you'd take that one, Jane. No, I'll start then. So I am not aware of any research, and I don't think any exists, that have looked at that particular intervention. As Matt, I think, mentioned earlier, there has been this movement to reduce the use of seclusion and restraints, and um, we're very supportive of that measure, but the question really arises when you need more tools in your toolbox, which could include seclusion and restraint. Um, you know, most hospitals do have a seclusion area or a quiet room um, that we've experienced. Also, we've been at some institutions which have designated certainly units or even cottages for more violent or the patients with greater potential for violence and therefore they, you know, have 
additional security measures there and also more staffing. Matt, anything to add? Um, yeah, I guess what I'd like to say is, you know, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything in the literature. I mean, you know, as a direct answer to your question. But, you know, I think within the facility, um, you know, it's important to look at what's going on that's leading this patient to, or these patients to, you know, to escalate. Uh, you know, to me, seclusion is reasonable, but it's kind of a last resort or pretty close to a last resort. So, you know, is there a way, you know, would more staffing allow uh, the quality of care to be better and the patient's needs to be better met and maybe some of the seclusion uh, episodes wouldn't be necessary? Um, are there sort of early warning signs? You know, if there's a couple patients who repeatedly need to be secluded, um, you know, is there, is there a way to reevaluate the, the diagnoses that they're there for and the care that they're receiving and see if there's some other way to, uh, you know, to, to provide their care so that, uh, you know, they're not escalating or acting out uh, to the point where staff feels that they need to be secluded. Okay. Our next question um, is, we deal with many dementia patients who become agitated and swing, bite, or throw. What are your thoughts on managing this population when they're unaware of their actions? Well, um, let me start. As we, as I said um, in the opening section, the intent of the patient or the perpetrator is not really something that needs to be addressed. The fact that um, a staff member is being injured, regardless of the intent, is what's important. So um, I would, you know, use the the tools that Matt and I have been talking about, try to get top management um, uh, aware of the problem, and this often comes from, you know, having to really enumerate how often this is happening and what are the consequences both in terms of cost and turnover. And, um, you know, you need to, to look at the medical management, look at the staffing level, look at what are the consequences both for the demented patient and also the family member when these types of incidents occur. So again, it's not about stigmatizing, you know, the elderly and those with dementia, but it's not in anybody's best interest. Matt? Yeah, you know, I'd just like to chime in. I mean, you know, similar uh, to my answer to the prior question about seclusion, I think it's important you know, to understand for the patients collectively and particularly for the individual patients who are, uh, you know, committing these assaults or striking out or throwing, you know, what is it about their care? Is there anything that can be done to, you know, to make modifications to the treatment plan so that they're acting out less? Um, you certainly, particularly if a patient with or without dementia, you know, really might be committing an assault. That just underscores what we said earlier that it's really uh, problematic for staff to be alone with, you know, a patient where there's a risk of assault, you know, without uh, there being another staff either assisting or at least nearby so that if things begin to get out of control, uh, you know, it can be dealt with. And, you know, this is also an example, you know, as Jane mentioned, you know, training is critical but not sufficient. So, you know, the, the training needs to focus on the specific patients, uh, you know, that you guys have and what their characteristics are and how staff should deal with them when a problem begins to arise. Okay, uh, and this will be our last question for today. Should we prepare nursing students for this problem by adding CPI or SAMA programs as a requirement as we do with CPR? So this question is referring to some of the existing um, training that is pretty prevalent in the um, inpatient mental health or psychiatric setting. Um, you know, certainly the 
early intervention to techniques and the ability for all nurses to know how to communicate effectively and de-escalate an anxious patient, which I think it's safe to assume most patients in the hospitals have reason to be anxious. Um, so the first part of that training, I think, um, would make sense to include within existing nursing um, education programs. The physical intervention techniques I would argue against because in our experience if you don't use those skills on a regular basis and have the ability to practice them um, you're not going to be effective using them when you need to and it can, it can even give you a false sense of security so we're really clear when we consult with employers that um, if you really expect the physical intervention technique training to work, you've got to have probably monthly practice sessions unless somebody's using them on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Well, thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us for today's virtual reading of Not Part of the Job, How to Take a Stand Against Violence in the Work Setting. Remember, you can get 15% off by going to nursesbooks.org and using the promo code VBR2015. Thanks again to Matt and Jane, and we hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. We appreciate your support of Nurses Books, the publishing arm of the American Nurses Association. Have a great day.